has come for such as I. This morning we're continuing our three-part series on the intertestamental period that is the time of about 400 years between the end of the writings of the Old Testament and the beginning of the writings of the New Testament. And if you weren't here last week, you missed this side of the slide, which is the political prism where we outlined what was happening in the political power of the day. And we talked about the prophecy of Daniel, houses of cards, which is the houses of all of the kings of that time, how the Romans came in and so-called rescued the whole situation politically by taking control and putting everyone under their boot, and then that the people were seething under that Roman domination. But that was in the plan of God during this intertestamental time moving everything toward a true understanding of Jesus when he would come. This week we're going to talk about the textual tumult and uh, our verse of scripture overall is uh, from Micah which is one of the last books of the Old Testament. And Micah 6, 8. And it reads, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Well, the reason that is our thematic verse is that's exactly the opposite of what the people of God were doing during this intertestamental period. And we're going to see that unfold as we go along. So let's start out with this idea of it's apocryphal, but let me fill in just a little bit of what we talked about last week to get you reviewed and sort of up to speed. Why is this important to talk about the intertestamental period? Is this just a bunch of history that we really don't need to pay much attention to? Or is it important? I say it's important because God has a plan that he pursues. He didn't take 400 years off. God was still wanting to work through his people, wanting his name to be sovereign over all the earth. And he seeks us through only one name. Isn't that, our, isn't that our proposal to a lost world? That it's not Buddha and it's not Mohammed and it's not any one of the other religions, even the modern New Age religions. It is only one name through which people are to be saved. And that is the name of Jesus. So it's important for us to solidify that in our minds and then in our hearts as we go out to a lost and hurting world. So this was the last composite slide that we had from last week. We had Caesar Augustus who was the uh, imperial crown over all of the Roman Empire and that the Western world. And under him was Herod and uh, the hierarchy of the religious people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And they're in this circle because they were kind of all in league to take advantage of the people. And we have the people down here that are suffering during this whole period of time under this domination. And of course, this is the time where uh, the novel Ben-Hur uh, that has a great principle and tells great lessons even though it is uh, um, fiction. And we have uh, this sort of thing that was happening during those days. So... How could it have come to this? You had 
the people of God that were supposed to be a bright shining light to the whole world according to the Old Testament and they were supposed to be the ones that everyone gathered in around so that they could hear about the one true God but how could it have come to this from that well it came to that because of what they were and were not believing and acting and one of the things that they were doing was they were going by so many of the old stories that had been put upon them by both the secular and the religious alike that were truisms but they were buying this selfishness so we have the Apocrypha, and we're going to unpack that just a little bit. In Greek, Apocrypha means hidden or silent. So we don't know what to do with this. If it's, we have it, but it's hidden. We don't understand that. Um, we even have a page here that's the uh, authorized version of the Apocrypha. You know, the King James Version had the Apocrypha, even though a, a separate section, but it was in all of the old King James Bibles. And um, so was it Scripture? Was it the Word of God? Was it inspired by God? Or was it not? What do we do with that? We don't find it in our Bibles today. If I ask any of you all to open up your Bibles and turn to 1 Maccabees, you would uh, have a little hard time trying to find that verse, wouldn't you? So, um, we're going to talk about why this is. There's 400 plus years where God is not talking to the Jews. That's what that means, hidden or silent. God is not talking to the Jews during that time. Why? There are no prophets. No prophets. Where's, what's the next prophet that shows up on the scene that everybody agrees was a prophet? John the Baptist. Right? So, there are no prophets. Despite all the prophets, the people and their leaders rejected the God of their fathers within this political prism and this textual tumult. You had the Old Testament Jews and they had their books that were not being paid enough attention to. If you look at the history of all of the Old Testament, you find that it's a series of covenant making and covenant breaking. Right? The Jews, they make a covenant. They say, we and our children from this day forward are going to go with this covenant. Next thing you know, their children grow up and break the covenant. And then they suffer because of it. And then because they suffer from it, they repent. And they come back to God and they say, we're going to make a new covenant with the Lord. And they make a new covenant. And this is going to be with us and our children forever. And then what happens? They break the covenant. Well, it's not just Jews, right, brothers and sisters? We all in this fallen world have a temptation to make covenant and break covenant. And this is what we need to understand, that God loves us and will take us back. But why, why do we make it hard on ourselves? Why don't we make a covenant and keep covenant? And I know that you mature Christians out here in our audience are doing just that. And I appreciate that from you and with you as the saints of the Lord. So, under this idea of silence or God not talking to the Jews during this 400 year period. God is not talking to them because he has told them all they need to know in order to prepare their country, relationships, minds, and hearts for the Messiah's coming. He's already told them that. It's in all of these books. How is that so? Well, let's unpack it a little bit. God gave them the law. Instructions under Moses, which is things you do and don't do as a people in families to prepare your country to meet the Messiah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the law, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, right? They had all of that. They weren't reading it. Then they had the writings as well. 
The writings were instructions under David, Solomon, Judges, the Chronicles, etc. In all of these books of the Old Testament that told them here's how relations go right and here's how relationships go wrong. You develop, build up the country to realize a king and show the world how to meet the Messiah. These books have all of that in there that show how to meet the Messiah. They weren't paying attention to those books either. And then finally, oh, let's talk about that a little bit. You had all the people. This is a beautiful little uh, masterpiece that was given to us years ago. And it shows people in the countryside, the humble people that were doing what Micah 6.8 says that we're supposed to do. To do right and walk humbly with our God in families. And even the coins had writing on them that said, remember your God and walk humbly with Him. And it was in their scripture. They were going to synagogue every Sunday, but they weren't getting the right kind of teaching and preaching in the synagogue. They were getting more apocryphal kinds of teachings. Finally, we had the prophet's instructions under Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezra, etc. These are the things you feel and your attitude adjustments while waiting within a fallen world to prepare your hearts and minds to meet the Messiah. That's all of these, the major prophets and the minor prophets. <clears throat> Why was God silent for 400 years? They already had everything he had to say. They just had to pay attention to it. And don't we? Don't we have everything God has to say? And we just need to pay attention to it more in our daily lives. So, in the apocryphal times... They should, the people of God, should have thought and acted, but this is what they did think and act. They should have thought and acted. They should have cried out to God and shown solidarity before Him. But what did they do? They split into rival constituencies who separated the people and made them fight against one another. How did they do that? Well, under Herod... And Caesar Augustus, they had foreign occupation. But then the Sadducees, which were most of the temple priests and the scribes, got together with this power structure and went along with it and just told the people what the power structure wanted to hear in order to keep their higher position within society. And the Pharisees were the same. There was foreign occupation here. And it was colluding with that foreign occupation that the priests and the leaders of their religion were in the middle of. Hmm, I wonder if any of our leaders of religion are in collusion with some of uh, the enemies of God today. I won't mention any names. They should have sought out godly kings of God's anointing. But what did they do? They elected and followed earthly kings who were not of the people of God. Notice here, this is a supposed drawing of what Herod might look like. And it has here, Idumean. What does that mean? Idumean. Idumea was an area bordering all the Arabic republics and tribes areas. And these are the people that were the people of Edom. What were the Edomites? They were the sons of Esau, not Isaac. So if you can get the picture here, the king of the Jews was not even a person of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was lineage of Abraham, but he was not of the lineage that God had blessed the most. And so you had an Edomitian person that was the king of the Jews. 
with a justice they should have with justice and humility wherein they would recognize the Christ and his proper coming. This, this Christ that's going to come is a Christ of humility, is a Christ that would not come riding, charging on a white horse and lopping off Roman heads. But they would have recognized that if they'd paid attention to the prophets and to the writings, what God was supposed to really be like when he came as the Messiah. They weren't listening to that. Instead, they robbed the poor and the middle class and set up a hierarchy to promote themselves. Hmm. Do you have a hierarchy in Washington, D.C. that's got everything set up to promote themselves? I don't know. You tell me. <clears throat> anyway, I'm getting way too political here, but I'm just saying. In the Bible, Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7 says, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Now, that's interesting. The first thing that Moses says through inspiration is these are to be on your hearts and you're to teach them to your children. All these commandments about the one sovereign God. But then in 7b and 8 verse of this it says you're to put them on the doorposts. And you remember they, they put the little mezuzah on the doorposts of their homes and they would come in and every time they would walk in they would, you know, rub the manusa and kiss it and, you know, that sort of thing. But that was on the doorposts and they would, all the scribes, Pharisees, everybody in leadership, even Herod would come in and do that little thing but it wasn't in his heart. It wasn't in their hearts. It was just on the doorposts. They forgot the first part of this verse. And they didn't teach it to their children properly because their lifestyles couldn't be maintained if they did that. <clears throat> Zechariah said, not by might nor by power, but my, by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by might, not by power. But they were all into the power structure. How were they in the power structure? Remember this from last week? We had Judas Maccabeus that came up, along and he went up against the Hasmoneans uh, under Antiochus IV and they rebelled and Maccabeus, Maccab in Hebrew or Aramaic means the hammer. So he came along and put the hammer down on those bad people. And they were all thinking, oh, well, we're all supposed to be like Judas Maccabeus. We're supposed to, whenever we get a chance, whack those Romans. And when the Messiah comes, he's going to put the big hammer down on everybody. That's not preparing them to be ready for our Messiah, is it? They will be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and be sought after. Well, during this intertestamental period, people weren't seeking after the Jews. They were just like everybody else. They were put ready to kill, uh, put the hammer down, uh, hate the Romans. They weren't in any way getting their hearts and minds ready to greet the proper true Messiah. So you had... All of this power structure, Caesar, the Pharisees, Herod, the Sadducees, that were all in this together, colluding against the people and keeping their place in the power structure. And finally we have Micah 6, eight. He's shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And Jesus came along and said, this is the way. I am the Messiah that you should be seeking. What about us? Are we doing this? Are we teaching this? Are we having this in our hearts? Or are we venturing way too close to that border between secular and sacred?
Now let's talk specifically and unpack the Apocrypha. We've talked about the fact that it wasn't the right thing, that they had everything they needed already from the Old Testament. But what are these Apocryphal writings and what do they reveal? Well, first of all, let's understand that they were not written by any official prophet. And they were not directly quoted by Jesus or the apostles in any of our New Testament. So that's where we get our New Testament from Jesus and the apostles that were those that followed him. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament that we have, we have 410 quotes from the Old Testament that either Jesus or the apostles gave us and referenced back. Out of those 410, there are no references whatsoever to the Apocrypha. Well, now that would give you a little clue right there, would it not? It was not recognized as canon by the Jews. It was not recognized by the early church councils as a part of the Old Testament or anything necessary during the intertestamental times. So what are they about, these books of the Apocrypha? They are history during the captivity and after the return and commentary on that history. They're basically saying, and this is what happened when Antiochus IV took over, and these are the horrible things that he did, and these are the people that came up against him. And so they are stories, and as history, it's great to have them. It's great to have these historical stories so that we can kind of follow the actions of people as they interacted with the people of God around Jerusalem during this intertestamental period. It was still, there were still things happening, still people being born and living and dying and developed all during, during that time. So here they are. Finally, we've unveiled what the books really are. These 14 books, now some people say there are a few more, some less. We won't get into all the detail of that. But First Esdras, second Tobit, Judith, completed Esther, in other words, chapters that have been added on to the end of Esther that we have in our Bible that tell more about Esther and the things that she and Mordecai did after uh, what happened and is documented there. <clears throat> Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, that is sometimes called um, uh, Sirach, uh, who's the main character there. Azariah, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, Prayer of Manasseh, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, and Baruch. So those are the 14. Why is that important besides history? Well, let's look at that a little bit. These are basically, if you had to boil them down, and I know a seminary professor would just wince that I'm trying to boil this down into one sentence, but I'm doing it anyway. These all boil down says that the Jews should be proud that they resisted bad Gentiles who mistreated them. And um, the Oxford Annotated Bible in the Revised Standard Version <clears throat> says this about these books. They're in the category, now this is not being derogatory, it's a literature category, that they're under the category of Pathetic history. Oh, woe is us. Everybody's against us. And everybody's, you know, mistreating us. So it's like the pathetic history, bombastic rhetoric, liturgy, and short moralistic novels. That's not me saying it. That's the Oxford Annotated Bible that gives us these, this information. So, where's the danger? What's the danger for us? What should we be watching out for? The danger is that embedded in many of these books, it seems to say that the Bible says, if you take these as canon or holy scripture, that we should fight fire with fire. And also, God can be manipulated to help us fight. And it's very evident in some of these moralistic tales 
that that's what they're doing. And if you start believing that, then what are you doing? You're trying to rule God. You're saying, God, I'm going to do these rituals, I'm going to say these things, and I'm going to be this person, and then you're going to come down and put the hammer down on these people that are not like me. And is that Jesus kind of thought process? Is that the true Messiah? No, it is not. I will tell you. Give my own answer. So, that's why we need to be worried about these. There are some people, especially in the academic community today, that will say, hey, the Apocrypha was even in the King James Bible. So if it's in the King James Bible of 1611 through 1649, it should still be in there. And you should pay attention to it like you should with all the other canonical uh, writings. Well, no, because it's taking us in the wrong direction if we do that. If we take it as history, we're okay. But don't take it as inspired word of God where God says we're supposed to be doing those things. And give you an example. Um, in 2 Maccabees, there is a passage of scripture that talks about um, Judas Maccabeus coming to a point where he comes to the temple and he prays for the dead. And as he prays for the dead, the dead are listening and uh, heaven is listening to his prayers because he's the hammer of God. Well, the Roman church that has 11 of these 14 in interwoven within their own Bible uses 2 Maccabees to justify purgatory. It's the only verse in the Bible, so to speak, that justifies purgatory. And so that's why we don't have it in our Bible. But if you were to witness to a, a Roman Catholic person, they might open their Bible and they have 2 Maccabees right there embedded within the books of the Old Testament. And they could read that to you and, and, and look at the top and it says, hey, this is the Old Testament, the real Old Testament. Okay, so I'm just giving you a little bit of an example, not to beat up on the Roman Catholics. We all know that I've done enough of that in the past. Um, sometimes these books are complementary to the Old Testament, but they add no substantial principle. And they teach some false information. And more than anything else, the Apocrypha does not prepare the hearts of the people toward preparation for the true Messiah. Now we're going to get to the Pseudepigrapha for just a few moments as we end up. I won't spend as much time on the Pseudepigrapha. As a matter of fact, I'm only going to spend a little bit of time on it. Now why do I have a hamburger on the slide of the Pseudepigrapha? Pseudepigrapha is a combination of two Greek words, pseud and epigrapha. Pseud, and that's where we get our, our term pseudo, something that's pseudo is not the real thing, right? So it's something false pretending to be true. So the pseudepigrapha is false writing pretending to be true, which is not good, right? Now that's, that reminded me of a plant-based burger. <laughs> Have you ever had a plant-based burger that they say it looks, it's, it tastes just like the real thing? Ooh, that's not my experience. <laughs> Is that your experience? No, probably not. I mean, you know, you might have bad taste buds <laughs> and you just think, oh, yeah, I guess so. Um, but that's what these books are. Book of Jubilees, Psalm of Solomon, 1st Enoch, 3rd Maccabees, and 4th Maccabees. These are all pseudepigrapha. And they are stories of Jewish life. They have exalted sentiments toward Judaism. They have a nationalistic outlook. The Jews are number one. Nobody else is number one. And we're going to beat all of you to Hades and Sheol when the end comes. Apocalypses, angelology, ancient scientific literature is all in these books. And yet, 
Some of them, people think, are, should be regarded as the same as the canon of Holy Scripture. Well, they're soy burgers. Okay? So, you didn't want to say that word a lot anyway, pseudepigrapha, pseudepigrapha. It's too many syllables. <laughs> the danger is that some extreme Zionist commentators will intersperse these stories or verses of scripture out of these and they will mix that with canon scripture to gain support from Christians. They'll say the Bible says or the Jewish tradition and history says that we still have in Jerusalem today is and they'll spout that out and then they'll add to it a verse from the Holy Scripture and you'll go, well by golly I guess that must be true. I've missed it all these years. We must be careful. We must know our Old Testament and what it's really like. And then finally as we finish out there are the agenda tales. The agenda tales are other rabbinical writings of the first century B.C on Jewish life and thought just prior to the beginning of the Christian era. And so what these are are uh, rabbis' writings and statements of leadership and all of that that go, that really take them because they're, they have an agenda. That's why they're called agenda tales. That's not my title. That's the title of scholars who have studied these scriptures. They're are these writings. They're agenda tales. There's an agenda there, ladies and gentlemen. So they're going quickly during that first century before Christ from the people of God to the Jewish state and its agenda. And we have a lot that we still glum on to concerning the Jewish state. We still want to watch that. They're still God's people, but so are we. And so, we need to appreciate all of that, appreciate all the history, appreciate the fact that our Savior was a Jewish person and chose those people to come through. All of that should be lauded, should be respected, but not these writings. But they were bestsellers in B.C. 100. These agenda tales were the bestsellers. And so, People were getting into the mindset that was not the mindset of the Messiah. And we have these words of Jesus that we so often do not pay attention to because they're sort of leading up to what he's going to actually teach. But how many times do you remember Jesus saying, you have heard it said, whatever, but I tell you, Remember that in the Sermon on the Mount particularly? You have heard it said to hate your enemies. But I say love your enemies. Do good to those who would persecute you. And given all of this material and the seething uh, way people were thinking back in those days, they would say, can this be a rabbi coming in here telling us to love our enemies? And so we know that they had trouble with Jesus because of this. And so next week we are going to take all of this information that we've gotten and we're going to center on those who were supposed to be the leaders of the people of God and their ecclesiastical egregiousness. And we'll talk about taxation without representation, how the system of oppression worked, and who were the boys in the back room. And we'll do that uh, next time. So.